Greetings, dear squidlings. Pestilence is in the air. Many of you are suffering its aura of fear, if not the affliction itself. So wrap yourself in the most comfortable duvet you own and meet me in the void. Coronavirus cannot inflict itself upon you in my domain. Void hugs are safe. It is times like this where we reflect on past pandemics, such as in the 6th century, the Justinian plague ravaged Constantinople, killing millions. Unfortunately, my speciality lies in a different disease, whereas this one was caused by Yersinia pestis. Oh. The disease caused by Yersinia pestis, known variously as the Great Pestilence, the Black Death, or simply Plague, is old. The earliest evidence of human infection is from a Neolithic tomb dated to around 3000 to 3500 BCE. From then, it has followed humanity around, often remaining dormant, but every so often revealing itself in pus and death, following trade routes from China, from the Middle East, North Africa, Europe, and eventually the New World. It actually comes in three forms, bubonic, pneumonic, and septicemic. Bubonic is the most common and the most well-known, named for the swellings of the lymph nodes that can swell to bursting with pus. Sometimes they turn black with necrosis, giving the disease its most famous nickname, the Black Death. Next is pneumonic, caused by infection of the lungs, which results in pneumonia. And finally, septicemic plague, which causes the extremities to turn black and die. Pneumonic plague and septicemic plague are almost always fatal if untreated, whereas bubonic plague is survivable untreated in a minority of cases. Now, the Black Death technically only refers to the outbreak in the mid-14th century. Half of Europe was killed and the world population overall was quartered. The word plague was taken from the Latin words meaning to strike down and to lament, reflecting the fear that followed it. Entire towns were wiped off the map. The dead were thrown into gigantic pits, for they were too great in number to bury properly. It almost seemed to be the apocalypse itself. According to John Clinn, an Irish friar, that disease entirely stripped villas, cities, castles and towns of inhabitants of men, so that scarcely anyone would be able to live in them. The plague was so contagious that those touching the dead, or even the sick, were immediately infected and died. No one confessing and the confessor were together led to the grave. Many died from carbuncles and from ulcers and pustules that could be seen on the shins and under the armpits. Some died as if in a frenzy, from pain of the head, others from spitting blood. In the convent of miners of Droida, 25, and in Dublin in the same order, three died. The cities of Dublin and Droida were almost destroyed and wasted of inhabitants and men, so that in Dublin alone, from the beginning of August right up until Christmas, 14,000 men died. The pestilence gravid strength in Colkinney during Lent, but between Christmas Day and 6th of March, eight friar preachers died. There was scarcely a house in which only one died, but commonly man and wife with their children and family going one way, namely, crossing to the grave. In response to this, Fear spread. People looking for a cause, someone to blame, something to give themselves the illusion of control. Leapers, follow runners, and Jews were all targeted, accused of poisoning the wells. In Erfurt, 1349, the Jewish community was massacred. Their area of town burned to the ground. Didn't stop 10,000 people dying of plague the following year. In response to this, sheer desperation meant that in most of Europe, apart from in England for some reason, Bans on autopsies were lifted. However, the medical theories of the day remained mostly unchanged. The main theory was humorism, where in balance of four bodily fluids, blood, phlegm, yellow bile and black bile was considered to bring good health. This was actually a fairly sophisticated view, with each humour being responsible for different processes and being aligned with different astrological bodies and alchemical elements. People were encouraged to eat different types of foods to increase or decrease the amount of humours, and if necessary, leeches, emetics, diuretics and laxatives could all be used to purge unwanted humours from the body. The language of this theory is still with us today. If you want to know why wine is considered dry? Because it was believed to promote dry humours. It should also be noted that humours were considered to affect both your physical and mental health, with different amounts of humours needed to different temperaments, Blood made you cheerful but naive. Phlegm made you chill but apathetic. Yellow bile made you passionate but salty. And black bile made you intellectual but depressed. Tag yourself in the comments. It is a great personality gauge and I highly 
recommend it. It's even as scientifically supported as the Myers Briggs test, so how's that going for it? But what could throw off the humours in such a widespread way? The King of France also asked this question. He was answered with the suggestion that an alignment of three planets in Aquarius had created in it a miasma that carried disease. Miasma was originally a Greek word that basically meant pollution. The ancient Greeks had an idea that acts that would offend the gods, like murder, incest, and sacrilege, would create a foul air. This air would attract disease and more crime. This is why criminals had to be exiled. They didn't want that nasty miasma anywhere near good citizens. It is also why trials of inanimate objects were not uncommon. Miasma is miasma, and you need to cleanse that shit. By the medieval period, the spiritual aspect had gone, but it was still believed that bad air caused disease. Bad air could be caused by a lot of things, including the alignment of certain planets, but stinkiness was a sign of it. In addition, it was noted as early as 1025 by a dude named Avicenna, whom more people should know about, that disease can be spread from person to person through breathing. Quick note, this meant that yes, medieval people bathed, got to wash that miasma off. It was less cool in England because England sucks, but most of Europe knew how to have a good wash. This meant that the plague did lead to advances in medicine, at least of the preventative sort. The earliest forms of quarantine were introduced and the houses of plague patients were locked and marked with a red cross so people knew to keep away. Of course, none of this tells you how to treat plague. The answer is basically everything was tried. Holy shit, like fixing your diet, got to keep your humours balanced, you nerd. Washing with vinegar and putting lavender everywhere was regularly used. I myself always recommend lavender, regardless of circumstances. It is a quality plant. However, desperate times called for desperate measures. A very popular technique was lancing, where the buboes would be cut open, drained of fluid, and then cauterized. This might have actually helped, given that you'd be draining away a lot of bacteria. Unfortunately, they then ruined it by dressing it in flowers and feces. A group known as flagellants would decide that plague was a punishment from God and went around whipping themselves, punishing themselves in the hope that God would spare them. Or they may just have been kinky, who knows. Some would strap chickens to their buboes in the hopes they would absorb the disease. Some would drink or bathe in urine. Some would eat ten-year-old treacle. Crushed emeralds were eaten because even when dying of plague, rich people have to show how rich they are. I hope the plague doctor in those cases were proud of their quality practices and redistributed the money like the comrades they were. Some were told to eat mercury or arsenic in the hopes that this would purge them of all their excess humours. Plague was sometimes seen to be caused by having too many of all the humours. Some were told to go live in a sewer because of the bad air of the sewer would drive away the worst air of the plague. Both of these were very effective in ensuring that if you didn't die of plague, you'd die of something else. I have studied these medieval cures and came up with the new treatments that you can try if you ever find yourself stranded in 1349. First you gather some lavender, eggshells and a clove of garlic. Then you grind them up together. Then you add honey or treacle and mix them up some more. Then you apply them to the buboes and have them consume some. I guarantee that this is more effective than some of these methods and won't kill the patient. Garlic and honey both actually have some antimicrobial properties, but don't tell anyone. Or, alternatively, you could get your time machine to go anywhere else. I recommend dinosaurs. The impact of the Black Death was massive, socially, religiously, culturally, and politically. Writing of the time became much more downbeat, contemplating the massive death all around them. La Danse Macabre became a common genre showing the theme of equality and death. Politically, though, it signalled the beginning of the end of feudalism and the medieval era overall. Peasants realised that as for they were rarer, they were more valuable and could bargain for higher wages and better working conditions. These were fought intensely by the nobles and gentry. In England, wage ceilings were placed in an attempt to fight this increased popular power. Popular revolts became more common and less localised as the transition into the early modern period continued. Attempts to criminalise this got more intense and elaborate. The church blamed the plague on mass impiety. Unfortunately for them, clergy, being the ones to tend to the affairs of the dying, were at high risk of infection, leading the public to see them as more corrupt. This increasing distrust of the Catholic church combined with the lack of clergy leading some to believe that people should just read the Bible themselves, 
laid some of the philosophical groundwork for the Protestant Reformation. Before I go, I want to clarify something. While plague doctors were employed in Europe since the initial Black Death outbreak, the distinctive mask, coat, stick and hat we all know and love originated in the 17th century, which is in the early modern period. So while it is more than encouraged to include everyone's favourite costume in your fiction, remember to set the date correctly. If you want a specific person to model a character on, I recommend George Ray of Mary King's Close, Edinburgh. He was the second plague doctor during the 1645 outbreak and was notable for actually being somewhat effective and surviving the outbreak. Unfortunately, the local government couldn't pay him because they promised him too much money, they expected him to die, and he spent the remaining ten years of his life trying and failing to get the promised money. He is a historical icon and more people should know about him. What I want you to take from this is that pandemics are scary. The death and illness they bring are more impactful upon humanity than anything else we have seen in history. But they are what create change, for good or ill. The normal we know is over. The coronavirus has revealed that true value from, comes from labour. The cruelty of the landlord and bourgeoisie class in evictions and forcing people to keep working for a crisis. We've also seen people come together in mutual aid groups, taking care of each other through isolation, making sure people can eat. These little pockets of spontaneous kindness are the seeds of a better world that, if nurtured, to grow into a truly just society. Be safe. Don't give in to fear. Keep an eye on the state's grabs to increase power and wash your hands. We can get through this together.